<sighs> I can't wait to play test zombies. Ooh, I could play rivalry. Ooh, or I could do Omega setups. Hmm. Is someone trying to have fun? No! Orcus! I'm being innovative! No! Go! Get out! Get in here, as a thought. We're deck building. Hey everybody, Joseph Rothschild here, aka MBT, back again with another episode of 10 Minute Testing. Today we're playing a spooky deck full of interesting and underrepresented fan favorite monsters, all of which are eclipsed by the three or four hyper consistent as a thought setup tools dominating the deck building of rogue archetypes format wide. I urge you to squint at the following list and pretend it's 2016 and we're playing Synchro Zombies. I present Zombies and Friends. So here's the deck, which is a solo Wathu Thondragay's Top 16 UDS Las Vegas build, whose deck profile I've included a link to in the description. As always, I'll give you background about the archetype, a little bit of a discussion about what I hope the deck can do, and of course, the card by card. So firstly, for those of you that don't know, Zombies is an archetype that's routinely occupied the periphery of the format. It's got a couple of extremely powerful pieces, Unizombie is a foolish burial akin to Armageddon Knight, there's a monster reborn on legs that's been playable for about a decade, and a recently released Shirinui Solitaire which finds all the relevant pieces of the engine. Despite that, a crippling weakness to another zombie, Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, alongside an inability to assemble exciting boards, means that this deck has been left in the dust circa Master Rule 4. Enter Structure Deck Zombie Horde. This precursor to the Soulburner structure includes two extremely powerful cards for undead aficionados. Necro World Banshee, a zombie world searcher, and Doom King Baylor Drock, one of the most powerful main deck monsters ever printed. If Baylor Drock is in the graveyard and there's a field spell on the field, he reanimates it in the standby phase, and when a zombie activates its effect, he can once per turn negate it, and once per turn banish a monster from the field. The astute among you will realize how incredibly well this plays with the zombie world, but don't pat yourself on the back too hard. Konami effectively dangled this interaction in your face by including it alongside Necro World in the structure. Despite this extremely powerful new leader in the deck, the TCG has refused to recognize the validity of this regime change. The deck has been relegated to deep tier 2 status, largely as a result of cheesy gotchas and mediocre interactions like Rivalry of Warlords. However, the year is 2019 and rogue decks need not accept their fate of unplayability lying down. By cramming enough dangers and the now popular Orcist Azathoth combo and Yazi Boral Sword setups into the list, we can make anything playable. Zombies are uniquely positioned to inherit these enablers, as the repeated discard that danger provides and Orcist demands sends stranded Mizukis, Gozukis, Baylordrocks, and Necro Worlds right into the dirt where they belong. Their setups are extremely consistent now that any two monsters makes the Azathod board, and Baylordrock adds an additional negate, a single card banish, and immense recursion to the otherwise try or die boards characteristic of Azathod. So with that, let's get into the card by card. First, we've got our Zombos. Three Mizuki, three Gozuki, three Unizombi, and three Otherworldly Banshee. That's followed by one Baylordrock, Armageddon Knight, and Armageddon Light, Dark Greffer. Following that is the Orcist Package, two copies of Nightmare Ebly, the Ascended Garnet, Harp Horror, Scared Zone, and World Wand. That's followed by the Dangers, three Nessie, three Mothman, three Chupacabra, three Snack, three Jackalope, and because we're really deep, one Bigfoot and one Thunderbird. Next are the Phantom Knights, Boots and Cloak, and then finally the Yazi Package, three Destrudo and one Mare Mare, which we have to be careful to get out before we go into Zombie World. We're also on Spells, one Rota, one Foolish, one Card Destruction, two Zombie World, one Rum, and one Brigadine. In the Extra, we've got Boral Guard Savage's Backup, Yazi, Azathoth, Redoer, Boral Sword, Summon Sork, Rusty, Nightmare's Unicorn, Phoenix and Cerberus, Gala T, two Sock. Mermaid, and Linkaribo. So with that, let's jump into the games. Our first match is up against Magical Musketeer. This deck will be exceptionally powerful in the coming months, as Magical Musketeer Max does a ton for the strategy. We are going first, and we have an amazing hand. It affords us access to both halves of our strategy. We'll start by normal summoning a copy of Armageddon Knight, sending a copy of Otherworldly Banshee to the graveyard before going into a copy of Danger Jackalope, a Nightmare Cerberus, and a Nightmare Mermaid. We'll get an orchestrated Nightmare from deck, special summoning Chubby Sneck, and going into Galatee. We'll use Nightmare's effect in order to send a Harp Horror to graveyard and get a Scherzo Skeleton to our side of the board. We'll then use Scherzo's effect to get back Galatee before activating the effect of Otherworldly Banshee, so Galatee is a zombie, and we can fetch a Baylordrock. 
We'll then go into a copy of Rusty Bardish, get ourselves a copy of Shade Brigandine, and activate Destrudo's Graveyard Effect, targeting the snake so he's a 4 and can be material for Time Thief Redoer. Afterwards, we'll go into Silent Boots, banish it, and get ourselves a rum before passing back to our opponent. In standby phase, we'll get ourselves a copy of Baylor Brock from Graveyard. We'll wait until they activate Devil Deal. They'll chain Bloody Crown to our rank up magic, but it's not a big deal. We can now go into Azathoth, and unfortunately, they are going into Exciton Knight. Now, I get a little bit greedy here. When Nessie goes to Graveyard, I could have banished the Exciton Knight before the battle phase, but I didn't expect the Thunderbird to actually be special summoned. Instead, I only have one negation, which means they will be able to destroy everything we hold dear, but it's not that big of a deal because in main phase two, we can activate Gozuki's effect to send a copy of Otherworldly Banshee to the graveyard, and once Baylor Drock starts recurring, our opponent concedes. As you can see, where this deck shines, comparable to similar Azathoth builds, is that if your board is broken, you have follow-up plays. Our second match is up against Trains, and it is extremely important we win this one to establish our status as the Alpha OTK deck. Unfortunately, we are going first, which is going to hamper our ability to OTK. We have access to both halves of our game plan, but this is really where the zombie half of the deck pulls its weight as hand trap bait. We'll normal summon a copy of Gozuki, activate its effect, there's the Ash Blossom, great! The gates are down. We'll go ahead and activate Danger Nessie's effect, we'll go into a Cerberus, go into a Mermaid, use Mermaid's effect to get a copy of Orcus Nightmare, we'll go into Galatea, use Nightmare's effect in Grave in order to send a Harp Horror, special summon a Scherzo Skeleton from our deck before going into Summon Sork. Because she's not a zombie, this time we will go ahead and get another copy of Orchestrated Nightmare because of the wands in the graveyard already. We'll go into a copy of Rusty Bardish, getting ourselves a copy of Shade Brigandine, banishing a copy of Boots for a copy of the Rum, then activating the Grave effect of Wand in order to bring back Harp Horror, make material for Redoer, go into Redoer, and then use its effect. Effect. Our opponent's going to activate the effect of Derecrane. We'll respond with a copy of Rank Up Magic. That means that Resolution will be able to destroy the Derecrane. They're going to set one and pass it back to us. We should be able to kill them from this position. We'll activate the effect of Summon Sorceress. They'll flip Skill Drain, and ugh, it is not looking good. We're going to special summon a copy of Mothman, normal summon a copy of Otherworldly Banshee, then go into a copy of Nightmare Phoenix so we can fill our board just a little bit more. This is far more than enough damage. We'll get a Zombie World to style, and then get in for 600, 1900, a whopping 1800, a 2100, and, of course, lethal. Well, it's time for game three, and let's dispense once and for all with the fiction that I am operating under convention. You'll get your best of three versus meta when I'm good and ready. Our third match is up against Altergeist. Our opponent is splashing some very interesting cards in order to make use of the synchro elements of the archetype, which, truth be told, is pretty sweet. We've opened Great once again, and we're going first. We're going to start by activating Foolish Burial, sending a Baylor Drock to Graveyard, the last thing we're missing. We're going to activate Nessie's Effect, an American Sniper, they hit it. We'll then go for a Mothman, which they thankfully miss, allowing us to go into the Nightmares. We'll use Mermaid's Effect in order to send a copy of Otherworldly Banshee to Graveyard before linking into Galatea, using Orcus Nightmare's Effect, using Harp Horror's Effect, getting a Scared Zone, linking into Summon Sorceress, using Scared Zone's Effect to bring back Galatea, Sorceress's Effect to bring out World Wand, going into Rusty Bardish, using Bardish's Effect. We'll activate the effect of Shade Brigandine and Silent Boots to get the Rum, then activate the effect of World Wand to bring back Harp Horror, link into Redoer, use Redoer's Effect, use Banshee's Effect, and pass it back. In standby phase, we're going to bring back this copy of Baylor Drock and wish our opponent the best. They'll set three and normal summon this copy of Melu Seek. That prompts the Azathoth from me. We'll destroy this copy of Melu Seek so they can't float. For turn, we draw and oh my god, trap cards. Are we going to have to interact this game? They'll go into a Melu Seek, a multi faker. We will activate the effect of Baylor Drock. They will protocol in response, destroying Baylor Drock, and then go into a copy of Conchieri. Of course, this did occur in draw phase, so in standby, we'll just bring him back. We'll activate the effect of Summon Sorceress, and then chain the effect of Baylor Drock, banishing a monster. We choose the Melu Seek before getting a copy of Gozuki. Then we're going to go into Thunderbird and link into Boral Sword. We'll then go into a Nessie, normal summon a Chupacabra, and get OTK. We get in for... Oh my god. Drowning Mirror Force! Okay, well, um, this Thunderbird is going to have to pull its weight. Not a ton of weight, because we do get Baylor Drock back, but enough weight to win us the game. We'll normal summon a copy of Snek, use the effect of Destrudo, go into a copy of Yazi, banishing a monster from our opponent's graveyard in the process. Our opponent will flip a Void Trap Hole, which means we get in for a fair amount of damage, but not lethal. We'll pass it back to our opponent for turn they draw... Oh, thank god, an MST. Well, as long as we fade a couple draw steps, it turns out we can win anything. We'll go to battle phase and get in with the Baylor Drock himself. Alright, so it's time for game four, and alright, alright, we'll do the best of three versus meta. Our opponent is on Salaman Great, and oh god, we're facing our worst matchup, going second. 
Our opponent is going first, and you can see not only do they have the full combo, they also have two hand traps, so we'll have to play through at least three pieces of interruption. They'll go into a Lady Debugger, getting a copy of Gazelle. They'll go into Veilinx, use Veilinx's effect to get a Sanctuary, go into a second Veilinx, triggering the effect of the Gazelle in hand, use Gazelle's effect to send a Roar, use Circle to get a Spinny to hand, activate the effect of Spinny, activate the second effect of Spinny, go into Mirage Stallio. Mirage Stallio is going to get a Falco, afterwards they'll go into a Sunlight Wolf, use Falco's effect to reset the Roar, go into a copy of a second Sunlight Wolf, use that effect to return the Circle, and pass it back. For turn, we draw a copy of Chupacabra, and maybe we can do this. We'll start with a Gozuki. There's an effect failure, so that is hand trap number one. Next, we're going to activate Danger Jackalope's effect. It's special summon to our side of the board. It triggers the effect of Sunlight Wolf, but I have plans for that zone anyway. We'll activate Troy Mayor Phoenix's effect. They'll chain the Roar. We know where the Roar is set, so we can force its activation early. We'll then go into a Danger Chupacabra. We'll activate the effect of Danger Jackalope. They'll activate Ash, and the shields are down! God, I hope they don't have exactly one more piece of interaction, because we are out of it. Thankfully they don't, so we can combo off. We'll use Harport to get Scared Zone. We'll go into Summon Sorceress. Use Scared Zone's effect to return this copy of Galatee. Use Summon Sorceress on the Galatee to go into Wand. Use Galatee's effect to shuffle back the Scared Zone skeleton before going to Rusty Bardish. Special summoning a copy from our Banished Zone of Diver. We'll then activate the effect of Shade Brigandine, overlaying for Time Thief Redoer. We activate the effect of Rusty Bardish, prompting the early Veilinx activation before attacking into the entirety of their board. We can also Time Seal our opponent because Time Thief Redoer allows us to set this Sanctuary back on top of their deck. For turn, they draw the Sanctuary. They'll go ahead and Normal Summon the Gazelle. Activating the effect, we'll chain the rum that we searched in order to go into As a Thought, and then of course we can pop the Gazelle. Our opponent will concede in response. All right, so it's time for game two, and our opponent has elected to allow us to go first. Potentially the correct decision. I mean, they play about a thousand hand traps, and they certainly don't want to get OTK'd. We're going to start by Normal Summoning a copy of Unizombie and using its effect. That prompts an effect failure from our opponent. Figuring the shields are mostly down, I'll go for Jackalope. That discards a copy of Destrudo. That's lucky. Before we go into the Nightmares, activate the effect and... Uh-oh. Okay, so we now cannot do our normal play, but we still have something at our disposal. We can bring back Destrudo as a 4 because of Snake and make Borlode Savage Dragon, equipping a Nightmare Cerberus. Our opponent draws for turn, they normal summon a copy of Lady Debugger, will negate that effect, and we have one counter remaining. Unfortunately, it doesn't destroy, so they can still attack our Snake. Now, we have a Unizombie, and theoretically, all we need is a Baylor Drock and an Otherworldly Banshee in the graveyard. We'll activate Unizombie's effect, sending a copy of Otherworldly Banshee to get the Zombie World, then the second effect effect, triggering Mothman, and then going into Vampire Sucker. We're going to bring back an Effect Veiler for our opponents. We draw a card. It's Armageddon Knight. That means we just have to survive till next turn, and we might be golden. Our opponent draws for turn. It's an Effect Veiler. They'll start by normal summoning a copy of Lady Debugger. We'll use our last negate. This is going to have to be enough. They'll attack into our copy of Vampire Sucker. Why does this thing have 1,700 attack? God, it's just Stratos. We draw a Mothman for turn. We'll normal summon a copy of Armageddon Knight, and it gets Veilered. So now things are looking a little crusty. Our opponent, if they have any relevant play, could pop off. As long as they don't draw anything meaningful, we are you kidding me? That is a burning draw if I've ever seen one. Will of the Salaman Great allows them to go into Wolf and set a copy of Rage. They'll go into a second Wolf and attack into our Armageddon Knight, and things are looking exceptionally bad. We draw for turn. It's a snake. Uh, they have to miss, and they do, thankfully. We draw a Choop and a Bigfoot. We'll use Bigfoot's effect targeting this copy of Sunlight Wolf. They'll chain Rage, destroying our board, meaning we could activate Choop's effect, reincarnate Bigfoot, and attack for exact lethal! So we're back with the deck, and oh, well, <laughs> that was surprising. Let's do the pros and cons. First, the pros. One, it's an amazing deck. I mean, right now the metagame seems pretty equally split between Thunders, Strikers, and Salamanders, with about 90 different rogue archetypes vying for the remainder of everything playable, but this makes a good case for Azathoth as the fourth consistent member of that trio. Two, among Azathoth decks, this is likely one of your better options. Baylor Drock affords much needed recursion to the deck, the zombie materials draw hand traps like nobody's business, and the Mizukis in Graveyard ensure that even if you're interrupted three times from your opener, you can assemble a formidable board. And three, while the Azaline is consistent and ever available, the icing on the cake is its ability to effectively go second. The availability to out Baylinx protected monsters and Colossi via Banish, as well as produce one card Boral Sword and Yazi setups, means that no deck is safe no matter how good they are at rock, paper, scissors. And the cons. One, there are technically hands that don't actually do anything. While there aren't any true garnets outside of Mare Mare and Nightmare, you'll often find yourself with hands that rely almost entirely on danger RNG to get going. Second, as a deck with an Azathoth line, the deck unfortunately misses out on one of the biggest benefits of playing Rogue, the ability to play the game without fear of dedicated sideboard hate. 
Cherry's targets of Sork or targeted Rusty Hate are just as applicable against us as they are against every other as a deck this format. And three, god it's expensive. Uh, 50 cards and 17 of them are dangerous? Ugh, don't pull a Necroz format and take out a second mortgage just to play a card game, kids. All in all, it's an exceptionally powerful deck with the ability to consistently compete against top options, and I expect to see it represented at high levels of competition as the format evolves. So that's that. It's been a while since we walked away with a meta match, and it always feels good when it happens. If you want to see me play the decks I make on this show on stream, I'm on twitch.tv slash mbtygo every Monday from 7 to 9 Eastern Standard Time, and if you have an idea for a deck or archetype you want to see on a future episode of this show, let me know in the comments section below. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.